on World News Tonight. Storm Watch. Western Australia braces for its strongest cyclone in nearly two decades as Cyclone Ilsa is expected to make landfall in the coming hours. Missile drills. North Korea fires ballistic missiles near Japanese waters. Will this further inflame tensions? More on this tonight. To fly or to not. China-Taiwan relations on tight rope as China proposes no-fly zone. And vistas of colour. New Jersey farm painted in colour as tulips bloom in full force. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening to all our viewers this Thursday night. Now, as usual, we have a ton of updates lined up for you tonight, starting off in the land down under Australia. Races for the strongest cyclone in over a decade as Cyclone Ilsa. A Category 4 cyclone is expected to make landfall in the Pilbara region of Western Australia in the coming hours. A red alert has been issued asking towns and communities in the path to seek shelter or evacuate from the region. The Bureau of Meteorology expects Cyclone Ilsa to cross the Pilbara coast of Western Australia tonight or Friday morning between Port Hedland and Balal Down, lashing the region with wind gusts in excess of 285 kilometres per hour. Australia uses a five-tier system to categorise cyclones, a different system to joint Typhoon Warning Centre, which earlier clocked Ilsa's winds at 215 kilometres per hour, making it the equivalent of a Category 4 Atlantic hurricane. The region is sparsely populated and the largest town near the storm's eye is Port Hedland, home to around 16,000 people, Aboriginal communities, cattle stations, mining sites and tourist operators are dotted around the area. Cyclone Ilsa is also expected to dump heavy rain on the region as much as 200 to 300 millimetres and vast areas of the state are under flood watch. Residents in the northern Japanese island of Hokkaido were temporarily evacuated as North Korea fired a ballistic missile test towards the Sea of Japan. The latest missile test comes as the heightened time where North Korea has cut communication with South Korea. North Korea fired a ballistic missile on Thursday morning, prompting a brief evacuation order for residents in northern Japan. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said it detected an intermediate-range or longer missile fired from near Pyongyang at about 7.23 a.m. on Thursday morning. It added the missile was launched at a high angle and flew about 1,000 kilometers before landing in the East Sea. The military said it's maintaining strong defense readiness by closely cooperating with the U.S. Soon after the launch, the Japanese government initially advised residents in the country's northern prefecture of Hokkaido to take shelter. It later lifted the measure after it believed there was no longer a possibility of the missile falling on Hokkaido or its surroundings, when the country's Coast Guard said it believed the ballistic missile had already fallen. The latest missile test comes as the North has remained unresponsive to routine calls with South Korea for about a week. The Inter-Korean Liaison Communication Channel and a military hotline are normally used twice a day, but there has been no response via either channel since last Friday. Experts have said Pyongyang's move appears to be in protest over the ongoing security cooperation between Seoul and Washington. Also, North Korea held its sixth and large meeting of the 8th Central Military Commission of the Workers' Party of Korea on Monday. According to North State Media, during the meeting, its leader Kim Jong-un stressed the need to expand the regime's war deterrence in a more practical, offensive and effective way. Thursday's launch came just 17 days after the regime fired a short-range ballistic missile last month. Taipei states that it has successfully convinced Beijing to reduce the scope of its plan to en of enforcing a no-fly zone area north of the island, which would have severely disrupted air travel amidst heightened tensions in the region. While Beijing is yet to comment, South Korea has stated that the decision was taken due to debris falling from the satellite launch vehicle. Taiwan said on Wednesday it had successfully urged China to drastically narrow its plan to close airspace north of the island thereby averting wider travel disruption in a period of high tension in the region due to China's military exercises. China has not commented on the no-fly zone, but South Korea, which was briefed on the plans, said the decision was taken due to an object falling from a satellite launch vehicle. 
Beijing originally notified Taipei it would impose a no-fly zone for three days from April the 16th to 18th, but Taiwan said this was later reduced to a period of just 27 minutes on Sunday morning after it protested. The development follows days of intense military drills that China has staged around Taiwan in response to President Tsai Ing-wen's meeting with US House Speaker Kevin McCarthy in California last week. It was against this backdrop that word of the airspace closure stoked fears of travel disruption across the region. When China imposed airspace restrictions during military drills last August, there were significant disruptions to flights in the region. French unions have called on workers to walk off the job and join protest rallies on Thursday for a 12th nationwide day of protests against a bill that will make the French work longer. At the entrance to this school in Paris, a note informs parents that the doors will remain closed this Thursday. All teaching staff are on strike, answering the call of the unions. It's the same for oil refineries. Employees have been urged to stop working on all of France's seven sites. Paris garbage collectors will also embark on the second phase of their renewable strike. As for transport, however, disruptions are expected to be relatively limited, both for trains and planes. Several major protests have been organized across France, such as here in central Paris. Unions will congregate at the Place de l'Opéra before marching to Bastille in the east. Hundreds of thousands of protesters are expected to turn out nationwide a day before the Constitutional Council is to decide on whether to approve the legislation. This could be a good opportunity for the Constitutional Council to modify the text. It could help to solve a thorny issue for Emmanuel Macron and Prime Minister Elizabeth Borne while also appeasing the unions. It could allow everybody to come back to the negotiating table in order to find a more acceptable way to proceed with the reform. The pension reform was pushed through Parliament last month without a vote. The cornerstone of the legislation remains the top sticking point, raising the retirement age from 62 to 64. As thousands of men flee the country to evade being drafted into the war, Russian authorities have taken to technology to make it harder to avoid conscription. According to the news measures, draft notices will soon be sent electronically. Failure to comply now also comes with a long list of penalties, including losing the right to drive and buy property. The last time Vladimir Putin announced a mobilization of the Russian military, there were protests in the streets, and thousands of men fled the country or went into hiding. Now the Russian government is trying to make it impossible for those hoping to avoid conscription to stay in the shadows. Under current law, draft notices have to be delivered in paper and in person, but soon it will be done with the click of a mouse. For citizens who did not appear at the military enlistment office, they will face a ban on leaving the country and a warning about subsequent penalties in case of failure to appear after 20 days. Under a new law, draft notices will be sent electronically, issued through a portal run by the government and already used for collecting taxes, processing passports and social benefits. For those who fail to respond to the electronic summonses, there is a long list of penalties, including a ban on driving, obtaining credit or loans, and selling or buying property. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov called the new law absolutely necessary, but added that it is not connected with the mobilization of more Russian men to fight in the Ukrainian war. But the move highlights Russia's need for reinforcements on the battlefield, with Moscow gearing up for a Ukrainian counteroffensive. In recent months, it has depended heavily on the Wagner mercenary group, which recruited thousands of prisoners to fight in exchange for their freedom. But Wagner ended that practice in February. <laughs> Meanwhile, Russian men already drafted to fight in the conflict have complained on social media that they were being sent to die senselessly on the front lines without the necessary necessary weapons and ammunition. More news on the other side of the short commercial break will be back soon. Welcome back. 
A proposed rescue package for Ailing Bank Credit Suisse has been rejected by the Swiss Parliament. The package, which called for uh, close to 120 billion US dollars in financial guarantees, drew fierce criticism from Swiss parliamentarians due to the use of emergency laws to bypass state legislature in an attempt to rescue the lender. Switzerland's parliament rejected a multi-billion dollar Credit Suisse rescue package on Wednesday. The deal included close to $121 billion in financial guarantees. The vote was largely symbolic though, as the government's commitment to financial guarantees cannot be overturned. Authorities used an emergency law to largely bypass the legislative body last month to rescue the lender. The move angered politicians and saw widespread criticism in Switzerland. It was the focus of a strident debate between Swiss lawmakers on Tuesday, which ran into the early hours. This was Swiss President Alain Berset speaking on Tuesday. A Credit Suisse bankruptcy would have had disastrous consequences for the country, for companies, for private clients, but also for the reputation of Switzerland. So in this context, we had to act fast. The Federal Council had to use the emergency law. Lawmakers were recalled to the country's capital Bern this week for the rare extraordinary session to discuss Credit Suisse's rescue. The lender was taken over by rival UBS for just over $3 billion last month. It was also backed up by $277 billion in guarantees and support. The Biden administration proposes introducing new privacy protection laws that will protect the identities of women who travel out of the state to legally have abortions. This new policy comes at a time where some U.S. states are doubling down on restricting abortion within their respective borders. In the battle over abortion access and punishment, the Biden administration on Wednesday proposed new privacy protections to prevent women's health information from being used to investigate or sue people over abortions. A senior administration official said the proposal by the U.S. Department of Health is aimed at protecting women living in states where abortion is illegal who travel out of state to have the procedure done, something research shows thousands of women are already doing. It is unclear whether the proposed rule would stifle criminal investigations. Fears of such investigations have grown after Idaho passed a law restricting some out-of-state travel for abortions. Major companies, including J.P. Morgan Chase, Amazon and Disney, have said they would pay travel costs for employees seeking abortions out of state. Republican leaders have threatened retribution. The proposed rule strengthens existing privacy protections under HIPAA, which are binding in all states. It was not clear, however, how that would work when pitted against state anti-abortion laws, which are a matter of criminal, not health care law. A string of judicial decisions and new state laws have banned women from getting abortions in many circumstances in large parts of the country, after last summer's Supreme Court ruling overturned Roe v. Wade including a decision last week by a federal judge in Texas to suspend the FDA's 23-year-old approval of a key abortion drug, a ruling currently being fought at a federal appeals court. We have some good news for you. Scientists have confirmed that nuclear fusion is safe and eco-friendly without the risk of explosion or radioactive waste. And South Korea is gearing up to build a, radio, a reactor that could commercialize nuclear fusion energy by 2035. The Korea Superconducting Tokamak Advanced Research, or K-STAR, aims to make nuclear fusion power a reality. It uses magnetic fields to generate and stabilize ultra-hot plasma. Its success in maintaining the high-temperature plasma for more than 20 seconds was announced back in 2020, but the feat wasn't officially published until September 2022 after being peer-reviewed. During that time, the K-STAR team broke their own record, managing in 2021 to maintain plasma for 30 seconds at 100 million degrees Celsius. That's seven times the temperature of the sun, hence its nickname, the artificial sun. This year, the Korea Institute of Fusion Energy now aims to maintain 100 million degrees Celsius for more than 50 seconds, with the ultimate goal of reaching 300 seconds by 2026. 
If we can reach 50 seconds this year, the technology will only improve from there. We're expecting to go through big changes this year. International competition to create fusion power for the future of clean and limitless energy is intensifying. But at the same time, the countries are also collaborating through ITER, the world's largest fusion experiment to build and operate the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. South Korea joined the 35-nation ITER consortium in late 2006, which also includes the European Union, the United States, Russia, China, Japan and India. Meanwhile, South Korea has announced that it has begun preparations to build a nuclear fusion reactor before 2035, which is when ITER is expected to begin operations. After testing its capacity for producing electric power, the government aims to complete the reactor plant by 2040. South Korea's first fusion reactor will have a capacity of 500 megawatts. The remaining time is to secure the technology. If the reactor is constructed as planned, it will begin operations around 2050. Nuclear fusion energy is the future of clean energy, as it doesn't emit carbon dioxide, nor does it produce long-lasting nuclear waste. And its main fuel is abundant and accessible, as it can be easily extracted from seawater. With this technology to change the paradigm of global energy, South Korea hopes to lead the commercialization of fusion energy. National Public Radio, or NPR, will no longer post content to its 52 official Twitter feeds in protest against a label by the social media platform that implies government involvement in the United States organization's editorial content. This comes after Twitter CEO Elon Musk has said that the social media company is roughly breaking even after the tech giant went on a cost-cutting spree and laid off thousands of employees. National Public Radio has decided to stop using Twitter. It follows a dispute between the US public broadcaster and Twitter over the label it's applied to NPR's accounts on the platform, which implies government involvement in its editorial content. NPR said on Wednesday Twitter refused its repeated requests to remove the inaccurate label of state-affiliated media, now changed to government-funded media. It said, quote, We are not putting our journalism on platforms that have demonstrated an interest in undermining our credibility. The outlet encouraged people to instead subscribe to its newsletters and follow NPR on other social media. The BBC, the national broadcaster of the UK, has also been at loggerheads with Twitter over its own labelling. It objected when Twitter described it as government-funded media, which has now been changed to publicly funded media. Twitter has been marked by chaos and uncertainty since Elon Musk's $44 billion buyout last year. Musk, however, says the company is roughly breaking even, even as many advertisers have paused spending on the platform since the takeover. Twitter did not immediately respond to his request for comment. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. India's Financial Crime Fighting Agency has opened an investigation into alleged violations of foreign exchange rules by the BBC. The investigation comes months after tax authorities searched the British broadcasters' offices in Mumbai and New Delhi. United Arab Emirates President Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed arrived in the Egyptian capital Cairo. The reason for his visit was not immediately clear. Chilean students faced off with police during a march against a new law that calls for harsher punishments for crimes against officers. The law was published this week in Chile's official gazette and has been criticized by human rights groups. Donald Trump is suing his former lawyer Michael Cohen for more than $500 million. The lawsuit alleges Cohen violated his attorney-client relationship with Trump by revealing his confidences and spreading falsehoods in books, podcasts and media appearances. A fire broke out in a plastic recycling plant in the state of Indiana. Environmental authorities have evacuated over 2,000 residents in the area over concerns of toxic discharge from the fire. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. And in case you missed watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with New Jersey's Dalton Farms, colorfully painted with tulips in full bloom. Thank you for watching and wish you all a prosperous, singular and Tamil New Year. Stay safe and have a good night.